Hi there, welcome to today's presentation entitled How to Prepare Project Schedules. The agenda for this uh, for this course is uh, we'll spend a couple minutes and talk about me, then we'll look at the course objectives, and then deep dive into the four lessons. Lessons number one is we'll talk about Gantt charts. Lesson two, uh, something called CPM. Three, PERT. And then number four, we'll dive into something called the line of balance. So moving forward, um, about me, I'll be your instructor for this presentation. My name is Rich Weller. I know there's a lot of words on this uh, this screen. I'm not about to sit here and read through all of those. You can peruse those with your eyes. I, um, but I did uh, did feel it was kind of important to to bring a, highlight a few things for today's presentation. Um, so I kind of bolded those in in, in uh, red here. I've uh, I've got over 20 years experience in the project management space. And I'm a, a part-time instructor for Washtenaw uh, Community College. I'm also certified in uh, Microsoft Project as well as a PMP certified project management professional. Professional. Um, I'm also a member of the Microsoft Project Users Group and a couple of local PMI um, chapters, the Project Management Institute chapter. So I'm um, pretty active in the uh, in the project management space. Um, the, our course objectives, by the end of this course, uh, you should be able to uh, name a few different scheduling approaches or methods and describe how each of those is developed. The reason that this is important, um, it is, it's because it will help arm you with the information that will allow you to choose the best scheduling approach for your needs or the needs of your organization. So. Let's dive right into the first approach. Uh, lesson number one is about Gantt charts. So a Gantt chart, um, uh, the definition that I'm showing you here uh, is coming directly from the Project Management Body of Knowledge, the sixth edition, 2017. And the definition of a Gantt chart is a bar chart of schedule information where activities are listed on the vertical axis dates are shown on the horizontal axis and activity durations are shown um, as horizontal bars um, placed accordingly with their start and finish dates. So I bolded a few few key words here, activities, dates, and durations. And so if we move to the next slide, I actually created a um, uh, an example, uh, a bar chart uh, example in Excel. So you can see in this picture, this example could easily be created in Excel where you have your activities down the left hand side, you have your dates across the uh, um, across the top, uh, and then and then the uh, the duration for each one of these tasks is depicted by the length of the the bar. So uh, we had the previous slide showed us the definition, and now you see an example of a bar chart in Excel. But remember, um, we uh, we. Um, are talking about Gantt charts. Uh, that's that's our topic. So unlike a bar chart, the modern Gantt chart shows the dependency dependency relationship between activities. So um, so let's move forward now and and show how we would. Uh, um, show those dependencies. So I, I took that uh, bar chart in Excel and, uh, and created these uh, lines uh, with the arrows on it showing the interrelationship um, between these tasks or the dependencies between these tasks. So this is an example of how you would create a Gantt chart in Excel that has those dependencies. And then the next slide I'll show you is um, is actually a snapshot from the Gantt chart view from a Microsoft project schedule. So you can see by default the uh, Gantt chart view has the uh, the the tasks uh, down down kind of down the left hand side. Uh, the dates across the top, the duration of each of the tasks are depicted in the bar, the length of the bar, and uh, you can see the interdependencies or the dependencies between these tasks with the arrows. So this is the out of the box Gantt chart view uh, that it would be created by that you could create uh, within Microsoft Project. So moving forward, lesson number two, that's about CPM. CPM standard stands for critical path method. 
So if we don't jump into the definition of CPM, it is a method used to estimate the minimum project duration and determine the amount of schedule flexibility on the logical network paths within the schedule model. A lot of words there, uh, some, some key uh, words, it's uh, the minimum project duration uh, and flexibility. So again, we, we snag this definition from the Project Management Institute's uh, project management body of knowledge. So if you wanted to learn more about it, you could go there. Um, but let's let's talk let's dive into this CPM a little bit farther. So there's some steps to to, to go about that you would need to go through to develop this uh, CPM. Number one, you would need to really understand the the background or understand your project. What's it, what's it all about? Once you have that understanding of the the scope of the project, on um, the requirements for the project, then you would want to develop something called a WB a WBS. Um, then develop a network diagram. Once we have that network diagram in place, we assign resources and then determine duration. So these are the steps to develop, uh, steps to develop. So um, step number one, understanding the project. So what you would want to do here is review any and all documentation that, you, that exists around the project. Visit the location where the, um, the project or the activities are going to occur. occur. Interview any, uh, any and all uh, key stakeholders, someone has, that has a vested interest in the project. And make sure you acquire the key subject matter experts um, as team members who's going to help you uh, with this project and help you understand the project. So that's step number one. Step number two is to develop a WBS. A WBS stands for, or WBS stands for Work Breakdown Structure. In essence, what you're doing is you're taking that big project that you have and you're breaking that down into, into activities. You're wanting to break that project down into finite activities. Um, in order to do that, the first thing that you would do is take your project and kind of create phases and uh, maybe our project is to you know is to build a house or it's a construction project so uh, so we've uh, created these uh, I've created these seven different phases if you will uh, for high level phases for the project uh, as my you know first level first breakdown first level of the work breakdown structure but then you want to add a little bit more detail. So you can see here on this slide that phase number five is, is foundation. So if we take that foundation and we decompose that a little bit farther, we can take, we can break foundation into footings and then found foundation is the next level down. Um, but in the underneath footings, we can decompose that even farther. So we take footings um, and decompose that down to um, the activity level where we're saying for footings, we want to lay out the footings, excavate the footings, form the footings, reinforce the footings, and so forth. And so what we're doing is we're taking that big project, we're leveraging a work breakdown structure, decomposing it down until we determine what the tax, tasks are required for the project. And so that's that's what we do. So once we get those tasks identified, the step number three is to create a network diagram. And we start with this uh, with an empty box that looks like what's on the screen here. This box is officially called a node. And uh, and so once we have this node in place, what we would then do um, is we would add the first task that's uh, that we no needs to occur uh, in, we put that task name inside the box. Uh, so the task name goes right in the, uh, the first task goes, the name of that first task goes right in the center of that large section of the box. And we can see we've got the task for excavate. And then we add another box and insert the next task. And we continue this, uh, or, or I should say, once we add this uh, next task, we use a uh, an arrow to show the predecessor and successor relationship between those tasks. So basically what this picture is telling us is that the excavate task must complete uh, before the form and pour slab task can start. So that's what we're saying in this picture. And we continue adding uh, boxes and arrows for all of the tasks that are on our project. And so this, once we're done, this is our network diagram. 
we've created a network diagram. So this this is a four a, a simple little project that we've got here that contains four tasks, and we're going to talk about um, uh, so that we can uh, we can explain this uh, you know this process for this critical path method of scheduling. So we've got this uh, four task project here, and this is in we're looking at this in our network diagram. So step number four, the next step in the process, is to add resources or assign resources. And and you can see we've uh, we've added names, resource names to to each one of these tasks or above each one of these tasks. And uh, and what this does, we're we're assigning the responsible, the person that's responsible for conducting this task. And the reason that we do this is it helps us establish accountability. All right, and we know, we know who is accountable for what, and also um, it also helps with with the buy-in. If you once you um, have somebody that's responsible for a task and and they provide you input and and are contributing to the project, uh, it helps to get get them to buy in buy into the project, what needs to happen, and and support you, and uh, they will work really hard to uh, to make things make sure things get done right and in the right way and in the right time so step number five is to establish durations and so the objective of this step is to determine how long each task or activity it, it will take to complete and but before we do this before we you know establish duration um, one of the first things that we need to, to understand is the difference between the two terms work and duration, work and duration. Those are two different things, and uh, sometimes a little bit confusing when you're uh, new into uh, pro the project management space. So let's uh, let's let's look at each of those a little bit closer. So work versus duration. I say work. That's the amount of effort that's required to complete a task. Effort. You can see I've got that underlined there. Duration. That's the amount of time um, that it's that's given to to complete the task. So effort and duration, or uh, work and duration, effort and time, two different variables. But again, we're we're just looking at words here. Let's let's uh, let's use a real life example or scenario, one that we can all relate to. So let's say your spouse would like to have the living room painted while you're on vacation. You've done this before, so you know that it requires about 10 hours worth of work or effort. 10 hour, it requires about 10 hours of your time to do this, um, paint this living room, but you're going to give yourself a full week to get it done. So in that scenario, work would be equal to 10 hours, where duration would be equal to five days. And five five days um, and so there that's a real world scenario to help you understand the difference between work and duration and those are two different values or variables and so again what we're what we're wanting to do next is add the duration variable to each one of these tasks and uh, so we've started out here uh, or we've 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 done that um, in this step, we've uh, we've we've gotten the duration estimate from each one of the resources. For instance, John said it was going to take three days to complete that excavate task. Uh, he also said it would take six days to form and pour slab. Bill said he could have that in tent power installed in one day, and then finally, Kevin said it would take him it would take him five days to. Uh, uh, frame the exterior wall. So once we get those duration estimates, you'll notice that it's a one one value. Uh, we input those values into the top center quadrant of the of the node. And and then and now um, just a little bit more about this critical path method of schedule, scheduling. Um, it it what we do is it calculates we calculate the early and late start. And finish for each activity uh, based upon our uh, sequential network diagram or the logic that's in our network diagram based upon that that one single duration estimate and what what we end up doing is is focusing on or uh, calculating the value of float and we'll, we'll, because that's that's really important um, because that helps us float determines uh, how much uh, flexibility we have uh, on on tasks and so with that definition let's uh, let's let's do something called a forward pass so this forward pass step again we're 
focusing on the critical path method of scheduling, this forward pass involves calculating the early start and early finish dates for each task. So you can see we've got our node here. Um, we, we know our activity name goes in the center uh, box. The duration value goes in the upper middle quadrant. Early start value goes on the left and early finish value goes on the right upper quadrant. And so those are where those attributes sit. So let's move forward now and let's, let's, let's execute our forward pass um, through our four task project. So in order to do this forward pass, what we do is we begin with the first task in our project schedule, the uh, excavate task. And we, we um, put that first early start, we input a zero. And once we have that zero in place, what we do next is we, we then do a calculation where we add the duration value to the early start, and that gives us that early finish value. So you can see zero plus three, that equals three. And that's how you perform that step. So next, we then transfer that, um, that three from the early finish date of that uh, node to the early start date of, of the of the next tasks in the in the logical sequence again transfer the early finish to the early start of the next task so you can see there I circled big green circles that were transferring the three uh, from the previous task or that predecessor task into those next two tasks we we now perform our math uh, three plus six is nine on the uh, for task above and three plus one is four on the uh, on the install temp power task. And so we input those values. And then the next step in the process is to transfer the largest early finish value to the next early start. So, so you can see two tasks actually feed into this. We have two tasks feeding into this, this final task here. And what we want to, the, the value that we want to transfer is actually the larger of the two. And that's what we've done here. And we perform our calculation and we, um, this, uh, this you can see 9 plus 5 is, is 14, and, and what you've done now is you've now completed that forward pass. And what we get from this forward pass is, uh, um, from this calculated information, is we now know that this project is going to take 14 days to complete. And so this is, uh, this is the value, one of the values of creating that, uh, or performing that forward pass. But the next thing in the process that we need to do is to perform what's called a backward pass. And this involves calculating the um, late start and late finish values for each task. You can see late start and late finish there at the bottom uh, corners of, of the node. And so let's uh, let's see how we perform that step. So um, in order to perform or start the backward pass, we simply transfer our value straight down that we ended on that uh, uh, ended up with you can, you can see we moved the for, the value for 14 straight down and now what you do is um, <clears throat> you transfer uh, uh, yeah so we've, we've transferred that uh, early finish to the late finish and that's what we've done on this step and now what we do is we subtract the duration from the late finish so what we've done here is we've taken the 14 minus five for the duration and that gives us nine and so we we input that into the late start quadrant of that of that node now tra transferring the value forward we now transfer that nine to the or in the nine to the next to two tasks uh, we uh, to the late start to the next those ne next late finish quadrants of those two tasks. We do our math, subtracting the duration, and you can see we get two different values this time, a three and an eight. And so the question is, okay, well, which one do we transfer forward? And we, we would transfer the smaller of the two late start values forward. So you can see we transferred the three across there. And then finally, we do our um, subtract um, uh, the duration from that ending with the zero, and we have now completed the backwards pass. Now the value of completing that backwards pass is it allows us we we can 
from this from here we can calculate the total float and so now let me show you how to do that total float it's the difference between early start and late start or early finish and late finish so you can get it either way early you can you know early the difference between early start and late start or early finish and late finish so um, this is these where the values at and like as you can see here zero minus zero is zero or three minus three is also zero so this is what we're going to do we're going to perform this uh, uh, calculate the float for each one of these tasks and so the next slide we shows you we have done that so we we input that total float value in each one of those cells and you'll notice for the top three tasks um, there's zero float and on that bottom task the install temp power that value is set to a five um, so so what that means with that value of five that means that task uh, can be delayed for up to five days without impacting the start of the next task that's uh, that's in that network diagram or that's in that path. So that's that's valuable information to a project manager um, who's you know trying to manage all of the tasks and activities and resources and dollars uh, within a project, knowing knowing uh, how much a task can could be moved or could be slipped. Um, or could slip um, without impacting things is a great piece of information and the um, the more important piece the more important thing that that gives us um, uh, performing that uh, ca calculating that float is it helps us identify the tasks that are on the critical path so the critical path activities they have that zero in the float value and the reason that the critical path is so important those tasks that are on the critical path are so important is because any task that's um, uh, any any task that's on the critical path, if it gets delayed, it's going to impact the start of the next task, and this delay will also impact the overall project finish date. So any one day delay in a task on the critical path will turn into a one day delay in the overall project finish date. <clears throat> couple other bullet points here that uh, note that the critical critical path is the longest path through your network diagram so your network diagram could have multiple paths um, the critical path is going to be the longest path through the network diagram and it uh, the duration of those uh, those tasks that are on the critical path is also the shortest amount of time in which your project could could be completed so those are some bullet points around the around the critical path and, and why it's important let's uh, let's examine the uh, the the tasks that are on the critical path in our little four project schedule so we can see those uh, that I've got them highlighted here and these are the tasks that have the zero float and so these are the tasks that are on the critical path of this uh, of this project so moving forward, uh, just another little snapshot from Microsoft Project. We've got the same four tasks. Uh, you can see that uh, I brought in a, uh, and I est established the same logic and the same duration. Um, and you can see that I brought in a, a, a field here into this view, a column from Microsoft Project that says total slack. And you can see that there's that same five days sitting here. We can also see um, how it's possible to uh, format the the critical the bar uh, the task bars in Microsoft Project so that we can see those those critical path tasks in red and we can see the one task that's not on the critical path is automatically you know formatted as blue so so um, the uh, Microsoft Project is showing us here that it abides by uh, the critical path method of scheduling so I think we've uh, completed that topic and now let's move into lesson number two it's around something called PERT and PERT stands for program evaluation and review technique program evaluation and review technique and to to be quite honest this is more it's currently 
um, known as something called the three-point estimating approach. So if you were going to do any research on this topic, you uh, and, and you may want to use that phrase, three-point estimating, because um, it's more of a, a modern term, if you will. But the definition here, and I'm pulling that definition from, uh, again, from the Project Management Institute's uh, PMBOK, um, the definition is a it's a technique uh, used to estimate either cost or duration cost it could be used to calculate cost or duration and what we do is we apply an average or a weighted average on three different variables those variables of optimistic pessimistic and most likely estimates um, and it's really used when there's a lot of uncertainty with the individual um, um, individual activity to estimates uh, and so a lot of words there let's let's put this into action let's let's run the play here oh so the moral of the story is uh, unlike our critical path method of scheduling where we ask for one duration value using the PERT um, approach or the three-point estimating approach we we now uh, ask for three and you can see here that I've um, I've got a little uh, matrix here that says uh, with, with respect to task A that uh, the optimistic estimate is it's going to take two days. The uh, most likely estimate is that it's going to take four days and the pessimistic es estimate, in other words, if everything goes wrong, um, it's it'll take eight days. And so this is how we would, um, instead of just asking for one duration estimate, we would ask for three. And once we get those three values or variables or estimates, I guess is a better, is the right word, uh, we would execute or run this formula. And so what we will be calculating here is ex the expected duration. And and this is the PERT formula, um, is calculating this expected duration. We take the optimistic value, um, we then add to that the four times the most likely value, then add the pessimistic to that and divide that all by six. And so we've got our values down below there, two, four, and eight. And so if we if we kind of run run this uh, formula through, I've, I've written it out here in a way that uh, you know we can we can walk it step by step. And so if I take that formula and I plug in my my values from below two uh, four times four. Um, well, you got your two uh, plus four times four plus eight divided by six, and uh, if we combine there four four times four is sixteen. Uh, then we we do our what's inside our parentheses there to to get twenty six divided by six. So the the final result here is that uh, we get uh, the expected duration or the um, the PERT calculation for this for this task. Task A is um, is at 4.33 days, and so this is how the uh, the this formula works. And what I've done here in this example is I've taken uh, those same four tasks, uh, and and we acquired three those three different duration estimates, and now we have the calculated uh, expected duration value for each one of those tasks. And again, this is this is done uh, when you have a lot of uncertainty. Or I've, I've actually used this in the real world in the past where people wouldn't didn't want to commit to a particular duration value. Um, I just simply ask them th for three and, and then uh, uh, use this formula to, to come up with the, with the one that we used moving forward. And again, one more snapshot here. We could actually um, input or create uh, those, those three columns, um, actually four columns, if you will, within Microsoft Project where, we're, where we um, input the uh, optimistic, most likely, and pessimistic, and then uh, we could have uh, Microsoft Project apply the formula automatically to give us that expected value. So uh, you can see here we've got a three-point estimate view uh, created in Microsoft Project. So again, Microsoft Project could be used to, to perform uh, PERT or three-point estimating for you, or at least help you, help you in it. You still have to gather the data and input the information. So 
Let us now move on to lesson number four, our final lesson around line of balance. So line of balance uh, is a method of showing uh, repetitive work. So that's a key key phrase here. It deal, it's dealing with repetitive work uh, that, that may, may exist in a project, uh, but being able to show that on a single line graph. So we're going to put repetitive work on a line graph. Unlike a bar chart, which shows the duration of activity, um, particular activities, a line of balance chart shows the the rate at which the work um, which makes up uh, all of the activities has to be undertaken to stay on schedule. The relationship of um, one trade or process to the subsequent trade or process is defined by the space that's between the lines. And then finally, if one group, um, you can see there I said one trade, uh, highlighted one trade, um, uh, or process. So if one group is one, running behind on your schedule, it will actually have an impact on the following group um, by showing us uh, that in the line graph. And I put a hyperlink there for uh, for where I referenced this uh, uh, line of balance uh, article if you want to know more or read more in details about it. Um, also, uh, coming from the Project Management Institute, you can see there an article down there below. A couple more bullet points. Um, the line of balance proposes that the planning of activities should be according to a rate of production or cycle, meaning the number of production units delivered by a working crew, okay, you can see I got crew, by a unit of time. So crew, group, uh, time, and then uh, finally this uh, concept is similar to a tack uh, to the concept of a, of tack time from the Toyota production system. So a lot of words here. Um, and now it's hard for me sometimes to get my head around words, so it works better when we can when we can have an example that we can walk through. So here's our example. Let's say that our project is to build six houses where each house consists of the following four activities. So activity A there is excavating. These are these are kind of our same, uh, uh, these are not the exact same, but these are four tasks around the house construction. So A is um, excavating, B is footings, C is framing, and then D is interior finishes. And you can see we have a, a duration value uh, tied to each one of these, uh, each one of these activities, and so what we do um, now is we we set up this, um, or I should say, if, with respect to house number one, if we were going to apply, you know, this the sequential logic, uh, and 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 using like that forward pass. Um, uh, approach. Uh, you can see that house number one, um, by the time we uh, comp took took these uh, tasks. So again, task A is two weeks, and so we we put a two there, and then transfer that two o'clock two across, and and then we add the duration value for fat task B, which is three, and that gives us a five. Transfer that across. Task C is going to take us four weeks, nine, and gives us nine, and then task D is going to start on week nine. It's going to take two weeks. So the moral of this story is that one house, or house number one, is going to take 11 it's going to complete on week number 11, 11 using this sequential logic approach. And if we were to graph that on, on our graph, it would look it would look like this. And so you can see that uh, all I'm doing is transferring I'm transferring the uh, the values um, that are that are calculated that we calculated here uh, on onto this onto this graph. Um, and so moving forward, um, you can see that I transferred that uh, those tasks and uh, that logic and those durations into Microsoft Project, and lo and behold, Microsoft Project also says that uh, you know one house is going to take 11 weeks to complete. And using that sequential logic, if one house takes 11 weeks to complete, if we followed that sequential or finish to start type approach, it would actually take us 66 weeks to to complete all six houses. You can see that uh, again. I tossed this information into Microsoft Project so we could so we could get a visual around the words I'm trying to say here. That uh, six houses using a sequential finish to start logic would take 66 weeks. Um, however, 
Oh, or I should say, and then zooming in and focusing on just two houses, right, with that logic, uh, two houses using that sequential logic would take us 22 weeks. So um, no, no, nothing uh, too difficult here w with the logic and the durations. I'm just trying to make a point that uh, uh, this, what we're using here is like a sequential, sequential logic approach. But in the, the line of balance approach, you'll remember that uh, it was... Uh, talking about repetitive work done by teams or groups. And so uh, let's go back to our original project. Uh, again, we've got uh, six houses where we want to build six houses and each of them uh, contain four activities. And if we, with respect to those activities, if, if we assign teams uh, to each one of those activities, just like I've done below, team one, team two, team three, uh, and team four, um, if we assign teams to each of those activities, we can do things differently and we can we can get things done much quicker and uh and so so th let's say our scenario is now this that we have these different teams assigned so what you would do now is you would go back to your uh, your model and and apply apply teams to your model and so we've uh, we've we've built this structure uh where we've put the the teams above the activity so so we're starting we we already had house 1 in place but now now we're putting in house 2 we can say see the same series of activities um and but we we calculate things uh, a little bit differently now we actually calculate things uh moving from a um uh, instead of a left to right motion we calculate moving from a uh, you know, from from a top from a top down. So, so in this case, uh, we simply uh, transfer transfer for for team number one. We transfer the two uh, from when that uh, when when task A completes. We transfer that down to the start date for house number two. So you can see we're transferring that two from here to here. And then we perform our duration estimate to get us the four. Uh, now we hop over to uh, to team two uh, for task B. We transfer that five down from the finish date of the, uh, uh, the house one to the start date of house two. And we continue that calculation um, moving from you know, from kind of from top to top, or top to bottom, calculating downwards. And the moral of the story here is that we could now, using the team approach, we could now complete two houses or complete that second house by by week 15. Uh, you can see that's calculated here. And this is opposed to week number 22 uh, when we were using a sequential approach. But but by bringing in teams and applying this approach, we're able to complete uh, this the second house at week 15. And so using this uh, using this information, we now can transfer this data uh, over to our graph. So you can see um, I've got uh, I've simply transferred the values uh, from from this uh, from house number two. Uh, this is this is house number two here. You can see that it's uh, it's rolling up rolling up this information for each one of these values. And house number two is going to complete at week 15. I've transferred that information to the graph. And now we here comes the hard part. I know you look at this, you say, "Oh my goodness, <clears throat> that's uh, that's so difficult, that's so complex." It's it's uh, it's uh, yeah, very manual for sure. Uh, we complete this uh, exercise of uh, putting in the repeated tasks uh, with with multiple teams, and we perform that mathematical calculation. And ultimately, what we could what we're ending up finding here is almost like the critical path, if you will, across this series of houses. And as we get to the bottom. And we get we complete our exercise of uh, performing this uh, calculation across uh, all of these um, all of these tasks for the d six different houses and the four different teams. Uh, we we discovered that the the project could actually be completed in in on in 31 weeks as as a, using this approach as a using the teams as a pro opposed to the 66 weeks that we came up with when uh, when we were using a very sequential approach but the 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 real value the things doesn't don't just stop here um this line of balance uh, oh uh, but before uh, before I go forward, let me let me show you. I kind of tested the logic, right? Because there's a lot of manual calculation that's going on here, and I actually um, 
and tested the logic uh, or the functionality of Microsoft Project when you use the le level all feature. So I had uh, loaded in the six houses uh, in the Microsoft Project and I simply hit the button level all and it went through and staggered things out and basically says that this project can be complete in 31 weeks. So the moral of the story is that this line of balance approach is actually incorporated into um, uh, the out of the box functionality of Microsoft Project. I just thought that was a, a good one to share. But again, the uh, the the we need to go one step farther to show you the more value, uh, a little bit more value in this line of balance approach because what we've got here, we've uh, we've took all that information that we had from the doing the calculations and we we transferred it to this, you know, we basically completed the graph. We can see that the overall all six projects, uh, I'm sorry, all six houses will be done in week 31. You can see that here, but you'll notice something interesting. You'll notice there's a, a staggered uh, all, all the a uh, the the first um, the first three lines are very straight uh, and then there's a staggered uh, approach or a stagger in this line this fourth line um, and uh, and and the the reason being is because what's happening here is that this team number four actually they they're starting a task. And once they're done with the first house, there's actually a pause where they're they're not doing anything, and then they're starting on the next uh, house, then pausing again. So there's actually some waste built into this schedule, if you will, where the team team four is uh, is really not not doing anything at various points in time. And um, so we want we could talk for just a moment about optimizing resources so if we look at if we looked at team four and we we added uh, we added their duration the, their total duration up down this column each one of those you know each one of those uh, houses six houses times two weeks um, their their total duration needed for the project is would be 12 weeks that's what they would be needed so if we took that 12 weeks <coughs> we could actually we could actually delay the start of, uh, of when we bring this this team four in, so if if our project is going to complete in week number 31, if we took 31 and subtracted 12 from that, that gives us 19. We could actually not bring in the team team uh, four until week 19, and and they would they would start immediately and work straight through. Uh, being optimized and very efficient, so and that would ultimately eliminate each one of these um, these periods of time where they where they weren't doing anything. So that uh, that is really the uh, one of the key values uh, or benefits of leveraging this line of balance approach. It allows you to see things visually and uh, and work to optimize your your resources and your schedule. So. Wrapping up here, what did we learn today? In summary, you learned about something called CPM, the critical path method of scheduling, uh, identifying uh, using a work breakdown structure to uh, I ultimately come up with the various tasks in your project, um, uh, putting, putting those tasks in a network diagram, assigning resources, and ultimately getting one duration value, taking that, uh, uh, then, then taking that network diagram and performing a forward pass, then a backwards pass to, to calculate uh, float or probably more importantly to find the critical path tasks on your project because the reason that is so important is that because of any one day delay in a task on the critical path uh, turns into one day delay in the overall uh, project schedule. We learned about uh, uh, the PERT chart uh, which is more common or more currently known as the three-point estimate estimating approach and that's uh, where we leverage the where we go after three different values of optimistic pessimistic and most likely and apply that uh, formula to give us our um, our estimate 
uh, Gantt charts, we saw the difference between Gantt charts and bar charts, knowing that Gantt charts have uh, logical relationship or dependencies. And then finally, we just looked at the line of balance, and where, which is really useful when we're talking about teams uh, conducting repetitive work. So that, uh, that concludes uh, today's presentation. I sincerely hope you found value in this information. Again, my name is Rich Weller, and you can uh, find more information about me, connect with me through all of the, or through your favorite social media um, applications uh, from richweller.com. So thank you very much for your time.